I want to, you know, get some opening thoughts in and, uh, you know, Narayan, you tell us so what are the key trends that you've observed, say, over the last 12 very, very unusual months uh, in this time? You know what? This, uh, there are many who say that this COVID-19 and associated uh, lockdown has been uh, a blessing in disguise. And let me explain what I mean by that. The whole world has been talking about how technology can be put to use. And education has been one sector that has been a bit of a lagger in terms of usage of digital technologies and, uh, uh, you know, online formats and other things. What this lockdown has done, it's just accelerated the pace at which acceptance of some of these uh, medium for the educator as well as the learner uh, is concerned. So what I see is this 12 months or you know, in 10 to 12 months has brought about a change that many have been trying to do for a decade or so since the internet came into existence. You're going to see a very different format in terms of learning. You're going to see uh, an, an extended phase of learning. Gone are those days where learning is only for the younger lot. It's going to be lifelong learning because things are changing so rapidly. You can't sit back on uh, on your laurels and say that I've learned all those things when I was 25 and then expect that to you know keep you good as you go. So there is going to be constant reskilling, constant upskilling that's going to be order of the day. There's going to be digital technologies and online platforms and blended formats of learning that is going to be here uh, for a good. And to that extent, uh, there's going to be a massive reinvention that needs to happen for everybody, not just the young learners. Kashyap, I guess uh, you and you know your team at Simply Learn probably saw this opportunity early on, right? And realized that this is going to be the order of the day. This constant need to upskill and keep yourself relevant. Uh, tell us, I mean, uh, what are the trends that you've noticed in the past couple of years, the, the profile of people who are coming in on the platform, and also uh, what COVID-19 meant for a business like you? Sure, Surbhi. Um, so, um, at, at Simply Learn, we've been seeing a gradual uptick on this entire, uh, you know, shift towards um, ongoing learning, as uh, Ryan was uh, talking about. Um, this is something that over the last decade we've seen continuously going up. That if I think about the early 2000s, most working professionals used to think about upskilling as something that the company would do for them. And in the last 10 years, growing uh, realization has been more this that if somebody wants to accelerate his career, then he needs to pick up the skills which are critical and uh, reinvent his career multiple times to basically make sure that he's growing. Um, and, and that is something that is really accelerated with COVID. So COVID has done two things. Uh, I think uh, on one side, the entire shift towards digital businesses, it has made people wake up to the realization that you know the job that they've been doing for the last 20 years probably the same way it cannot continue there's going to be a lot of reinvention a lot of transition in the industry a lot of roles are going to change they're going to get automated they're going to require new skills for a person to keep growing in his career and that realization is helping the entire upskilling space in a huge way um, the second disruption that COVID has uh, enforced on the industry in a lot of ways is the entire shift towards digital learning. That one is obviously you need to upskill because uh, the entire industry is changing. The second is more the, the way in which or the pedagogy in which a person is learning. And there the entire acceptance of digital. That when you are forced that you are, you are at your home, that's the only way that you can learn. Suddenly the entire comfort level and people waking up to the realization that you know, whatever inhibitions or inertia that existed before, um, when they were forced into this, you know, even forget about learning, even in social life, suddenly instead of meeting people, you're doing WhatsApp calls every day, right? It creates a different, different level of comfort with technology, different level of confidence in the technology that if I want to learn, I can learn virtually. Uh, it, it's not, uh, you know, anything different. It, you can get a great experience by learning online. But I, I think in both ways for the entire upskilling industry, it's been, an absolute transformation um, and, and we've definitely seen the entire tailwind as a result of that um, in the sector as a whole. The people waking up to the need to learn on an ongoing basis as well as, you know, uh, internet being able to provide an experience that's brilliant and doesn't really need an offline classroom anymore. So, so those are the two large macro trends that we've seen in our business. I mean, let me bring you in the conversation. I think a lot of my questions on the financing aspect will come to you a little later. But first, broad thoughts on... Uh, 
you know, just the kind of trends that you observe around this, the aspiration, just the need to, uh, you know, start thinking about education as something which is going to require planning from a financial standpoint. Okay, uh, thanks, Obi. So honestly, you know, it's uh, while the pandemic really made us relook at a lot of things, but uh, providing for one's child's education has always been the top uh, aspiration for every parent, especially in India. And we at Bajaj Alliance had a, a survey last year with Kantar. It was called the Bajaj Alliance Life India's Life Course Preparedness Sur Survey, and which clearly showed it. Unfortunately, what it also showed us was that 50% of Indians find it difficult to achieve, achieve their child's education goals. So, you know, while everybody is aspiring that you want to spend their kids to the best of places to study, uh, but what we've also seen is they are not financially ready to meet those expenses. And we've also seen that cost of education has been going up tremendously. Just to give you an idea, uh, the fees for an IIM could be is as high as 20 to 25 lakh rupees today, while five years back it was just 12 lakh rupees. And uh, you know, we we all know these stories about uh, the US where people pass out from the best of universities and most of them when they're getting into the jobs, they're actually getting into it with a huge debt. And that is something that, you know, some we can see coming in here, people are not prepared well enough. So I think it's very important that, you know, uh, when you start planning, you start, uh, people have to start planning for the future, looking, building into inflation, looking at how much money they would require and they need to start planning early. And this is one place that I think people miss out on. Uh, for example, you know, if you've got a child who's seven years or eight years, then you uh, say 10 years down the line, you want to send the child uh, to a good medical institute. You need to be ready saying, you know, this is the kind of expenses I would require by then. And if this is where my current income is, would I be in a position to support the kid? Well, mo mostly the answer to that would be no. So then you need to start investing and you start, need to start investing wisely. And the thing that you want to be very careful about here is that something that people need to understand is you have to keep the long-term focus here. Uh, see, the one thing about long-term investment, be it for child education or for anything else, is it always gives you the advantage of power of compounding, the rupee cost advantage, and you know, when you start mm -hmm. investing early, it's going to really help you. Sure. Uh, what I would also say, you know, uh, today there are a lot of tools available. There are calculators. Even on our website, we've got calculators for you where anybody can just get there and, you know, just type in what their goals are. Uh, and it'll give you approximately the kind of money you would require and the kind of investments you would require. If we're talking about some of the professional courses, the professional upskilling programs, Typically, uh, what are the costs we're looking at? Because the one uh, attraction of digital as a model is obviously that you're supposed to pay, of course, a fraction of the cost that you would have if you'd gone to an overseas university and then done the same course, right? So give us some sense of the, the money required here. Sense of the money required here varies. And honestly, uh, uh, you know, the thought that these digital courses are not that expensive uh, is not really that true also. Because I myself, you know, something just uh, building on what Kashyap had shared a little while ago. Uh, continuous upskilling. I think I'm somebody who's from an old school. I've, you know, an old MBA who went through the regular Philip Kotler, the hardcore brick and mortar model of working. But I think in the last five years, uh, I've had to uh, really upskill myself. I've done a lot of online courses. Believe you me, they're not really uh, that cheap. Uh, but again, uh, it's very relative when you say they're not cheap or they're expensive but i'm saying mm. what's really important is uh, no matter what you uh, looking at uh, you have to have the right kind of instruments and this is where i've seen you know uh, while you know we can say it's a fraction of a cost today mm. but that fraction of cost say against say you pay say about 25 lakh rupees for a full-time course but uh, this cost would cost you three lakh or four lakh but then so mm. we also have to look at the three lakh or four lakh today in india is it still something that anybody or everybody can afford. So no, you still have to plan for it, yeah. Precisely, you still have to plan for it. And this mm. is where it gets very interesting. You know, there are a lot of... Uh, mm. So today, when you start going out and deciding where you want to invest, you get a lot of uh, instruments that are there you can invest in. But finally, yeah. it's very important. You know, you should be very clear what your goal is and mm. how are you prepared for it. So just to give you a simple idea, uh, it is... 
I think it's very prudent to have some guaranteed income cash flow from your uh, investments, so that you're mm. you're sure whether you know you if it's for yourself or for your child, a certain amount is mm. guaranteed to come in. And you know we were surprised ourselves. Uh, you know, Bajaj Alliance, the survey that we talked about, the Life Goals Preparedness Survey, revealed that more than 50% of Indians viewed life insurance as a preferred investment option to achieve their child's education life goals. Mm. And you know that was quite interesting. And then we looked at what really works here, and some of the advantages that came out. We saw that uh, people said why they were looking at uh, life insurance. Was you know it said that they said that it provides discipline savings towards the long term uh, objective. The tax benefits are also there, and there's mm -hmm. also that life cover which takes care of any eventualities. Then the concept mm -hmm. of guaranteed benefits, and I just want to spend a little bit of time here. So mm -hmm. one thing that the entire pandemic has done for us is the concept of guaranteed has suddenly mm -hmm. become very very uh, important for people. So sure. most, then you know, people are getting a little conservative. So this guaranteed word really is starting to play very heavily on people's minds. Sure. And uh, I know I would say people need to be participating in India's growth story through market link products. That's their one way to invest. So there's something that we did. Uh, we in Bajaj Alliance, we uh, we launched a new uh, product which was called the Life uh, Bajaj Alliance Life Flex Income Goal. Uh, just to tell you what we've done with this product, and this is something which is very unique. Uh, we've given flexibility to receive or accumulate survival benefits. We're talking about cash bonuses. We're talking about guaranteed monthly income and guaranteed benefit. Flexibility to choose cash bonus from the first month onwards. So, so be as you would know, traditionally insurance is something where the biggest challenge people have had said was liquidity. But here we talk about something that gives you an income from the first month onwards. So we've hmm. also seen this, and we realize that you know when uh, people are saying they're looking at life insurance as one of the major avenues to invest from their uh, child hmm. education or their own education, whatever. So this is what we're trying to do, and think we're trying to provide the best instruments for people to invest in. So I'm sure. saying the costs are there, but you need to still be planned for it. It's like people can say the costs have come down drastically, but believe you me, that cost is still a big amount, and it's only going sure. higher. One thing we know that the insurance industry does offer are child plans, and I know for a fact because I mean I did a couple of conversations on this. I think the smartest thing that's working in favor of this product is the fact that there is a waiver of premium concept, right? Where even in the unfortunate event of the the parents' demise, the plan continues, the future premiums are are waived off. But you tell us, I mean, from scratch, really, what all does the life insurance industry have to offer to people who are looking at creating that corpus for either their children or for themselves? You know, we can say all we want, but this is still going to be a major cost, mm. and you have to be really planned for it. And you know, so what's very important is, I think, uh, when you say uh, you need to plan for education, you need to first set a goal for yourself. What is it that you're really looking at? Uh, it could not be very specific to a university, but it could be specific to a course, it could be specific to a degree or whatever. And then you have to start investing on it. And when you say investment, as investments going to depend on a lot of things. It's going to depend, of course, the first and foremost is going to be on your income. It's also going to be dependent on your risk-taking appetite. Look, not not all instruments are there for everyone. Also, the time horizon. Are you looking at a five-year, ten-year? So different uh, instruments for different horizons. And you also got to look at market conditions, inflation, etc., and then arrive at this. Uh, one thing we also tell everybody is. You need to have the right mix of asset allocation. You know the age-old saying: "Don't put all your eggs in one basket." So you need to have a very diversified portfolio. And this is also one of the unfortunate learnings that has come out from the COVID-19 pandemic: diversify risk and have a more balanced portfolio. So building on that, investors can actually use a goal-based approach to asset allocation. Suppose one has a 10-year investment goal. Since the investment horizon is longer. The investor can start off with higher allocation of equities and gradually start reducing equity allocation and switching to debt liquid fund as they approach the maturity term of the policy. This will help to protect the wealth created from investing in equities over the long term. 
So once you decide the asset class, the key is to stick to it for the long term by making systematic investments toward it. See, life insurance also provides you ULIPs, and ULIPs have this huge benefit of it not just ensures your life, invests in market. The biggest, and of course, up to two and a half lakhs a year, it gives you the benefit of taxation also. And the biggest advantage that I feel that ULIPs have is the ability to switch between funds. So depending on how the markets go, you can yourself or with the help of your consultant or your advisor, you can switch between equity, debt, or the right kind of funds at that time where you think you can beat the markets. So if you put all these things together, I think uh, if you have your goals clear, you have your risk appetite, you have your money set aside, and we have the right kind of plans for you after that. And I think if you invest, you should be well on way to achieve these expenses that are going to come up uh, for your or maybe your child's education. And like the two gentlemen have been saying, uh, education is no longer just for your children. Education for even for people like me and all of us here is for us to keep upskilling because if we want to survive or something like Narayan said, are we going to end up becoming obsolete, all of us? Yeah, absolutely. So Amit, just to follow up on that, I mean, you mentioned ULIPs. Uh, ULIPs, I guess, they can be used by anybody, right? I mean, to meet whichever goal in education could be one of them. Uh, whereas a child plan is something that I'm guessing younger parents should look at because that's where you should ideally be invested for at least 10 odd years to build that corpus. So would that be the right way of looking at it? Uh, see, the fact of the matter is, uh, finally, it's your money you invest. You could, it's finally up to you what the goal you set for yourself. Even for the child plan, finally, when the money comes to you, it's how it's positioned that you use it for your child's plan. The unit link plan also, you could invest in it. And the returns that come to you, say you, you pay for, say, five years or seven years, and 10 years or 15 years later, when the policy matures, the money that comes, you utilize it for a child's plan, uh, child education or whatever the expenses you need. Yes, child's plan, uh, the one you are talking about are more traditional products. They would certainly have uh, better guarantees or more, let's just say, but they would slightly be more on the, like, conservative side also. So if you look at it, that's what I said. The first and foremost thing I said is going to be your own risk-taking appetite. If you have very little risk-taking appetite, then yes, those are the plans you should be going for, where the guaranteed returns are there. Okay. So if, if someone is talking about a medium risk profile uh, investor and someone who's, who's young, so therefore can have more of an equity orientation, uh, typically, when you're going to invest in products like these, what what is uh, the right expectation to have in terms of returns? See, honestly, if you ask me, I would say it would be on the, you can comfortably see on the low double, uh, 10, 11% is the kind of stuff you can look at on a long-term horizon. And I'm being conservative there. But, uh, you know, that is uh, keeping in mind that there are no untoward incidents, some global pandemic hitting you but otherwise you can certainly uh, look at those as being uh, conservative numbers to go with 